um, Marceline in Kenya and Jacob from Ghana. After that, we're going to have a short break on area estimation and we're going to dive into drivers and we're going to have Anne from the FRA team giving us um, a peek sneak on the publication that was just launched today on the drivers of uh, deforestation related to different scales of agriculture. And then we're going to dive into the third part of the side event on open discussion and I would like to keep the most of the of the session on this. Uh, trying to maybe answer those questions or others as, as they right. So please keep your questions for the last part. We're going to try to address them at that moment. And without further ado, and if everybody's fine, I will just let um, Nekoa give us some introduction words. Yes. No, this is, yeah, it's good. No, and the Zoom, and the Zoom is in your notes and the... Uh, My notes? Uh, I'm asking what's up there. You can you switch the presenter and then... Yeah. Now we can, okay, now we can switch. That's good. Okay. Thank you, Aurelie. Um, okay, so uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, I am Naiko Aguilara Muchastegui. I work with the Carbon Fund at the Biocarbon Fund at the World Bank. I coordinate the support that we provide on MRV capacities to the Latin American and Caribbean countries, as well as the Francophone and Lusophone African countries. Uh, what we're going to be talking today uh, uh, about is basically what I see a clear example of why I say that MRV is a learning process. This is a journey that started 10 years ago, where we weren't all in in the remote sensing work towards tracking deforestation and forest degradation uh, we learned uh, from uh, failure and the difficulties that we were having in uh, realizing what was it that we were seeing with our data sets we were we became very good at detecting change but we although we were seeing things from the heavens we realized that we don't have god's holy knowledge of things and then context is a very relevant matter. But also, one of the things that we realize is that uh, by looking at maps and producing statistics from those, we were also uh, using biased estimators. So here came the idea of combining the maps, the data, the geospatial data, as we're gonna be seeing uh, in the presentation today, with uh, sampling approaches that would guarantee that we would not have that bias, which is part of what we are asked to do by the IPCC guidelines. I don't see Sandro here, but I mean, he, he's been hammering the world with, with that. So bias is one of the most important things that, that, that we need to take care for. Um, of course, we started doing sampling, uh, stratified random sampling based on strata defined by change maps. And now we're into I, what I would call an ador another evolution to that process, because uh, sampling intensities need to be high for us to capture this very rare phenomenon in the landscape, in many cases, which is deforestation, which, which entails that sampling efforts are huge, which is not always practical. So we need a means of priority prioritizing where to pay attention and really develop response designs that are really thorough and capitalize on as much evidence as is available for each one of those locations that we're going to be looking at and then trying to infer what happened. As we all know, it's not always the case. There's still challenges in some of those locations and we end up scratching our heads, but well, it's part of the journey that we are in and that we're trying to cover. So with that, uh, I pass it along to Remy, the floor. Thanks. Thank you, much. Thank you very much, Naikoa. Um, so yes, based on those, on, those, uh, on those ideas that we do need specific sampling design to address everything that we're trying to measure, I would like to invite Andreas Volrad to join us uh, and present his slides. And I hope you can see that. Can you see that on the Zoom? No, just give me a sec, sorry. <coughs> and
Thanks, Remy. Uh, can I get this? This should disappear, right? Okay. All right. Uh, thanks, Remy, for the introduction. Um, my name is Andreas Vollrath. I'm a remote sensing expert uh, working here at the FAO Forestry Division for the CPOL team. Um, I'm giving my talk on behalf of the National Forest Monitoring Team, uh, presenting on an approach that was collectively developed uh, throughout the last year uh, called Ensemble Sample Based Area Estimation and tries to address actually that what uh, NICOA just presented. So, uh, as NFM team at FAO, one of our main mandates is to support countries uh, in developing and advancing their national forest monitoring systems. And uh, while there are many different reasons to monitor your forest, uh, uh, one of the drivers uh, are, uh, car is carbon fineness. And for carbon fineness, we know that we, know we need reliable estimates of forest and forest change, uh, keyword high integrity data. Uh, which also needs to be consistent over time. And as NICOA said, we're moving to sample-based estimates to basically get unbiased estimates of forest area and forest change. But the problem is that with the small areas that we're having, we're ending up uh, in, in a lot of cases with uh, high uncertainties. And so the solution to that is basically intensify your sampling, uh, but this can end up in, in, in numbers that are becoming impractical to... No, I don't see the person. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, that's better. But... Yeah, no, it's fine. Don't, I'm, I'm controlling it. Okay, um, so yeah, we, we end up with a, 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 a high number of points that becomes impractical then to, to uh, look at each point. Uh, so with what I'm going to present today is basically a way that we're thinking how this issue can be addressed. Next slide, please. Um, if you start from scratch, uh, you basically start out with a very dense sampling grid, so for one, two kilometers. Um, and the advantage of having such a grid is that you can run uh, multiple uh, algorithms on it. So the first step is we extract time series from satellite data, we run certain different types of change algorithms such as PFAS, CCDC, and so on. We create some statistics on the time series data. Uh, we also add global data, for example, uh, the, the global forest uh, 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 GFC data set uh, from Hansen, so we get tree cover, we get tree height, uh, land cover, land use information. And so instead of classifying satellite imagery, we basically classify like the output of all of these different algorithms, assuming that some of them are right, some of them are wrong. But as an ensemble, we basically get better results overall. Uh, and for this, we, we use uh, training data either coming from the field or from visual interpretation. Now, when we do this classification, we don't classify like different classes, we just have a change and a no change class. And in this way, we can get out a probability of potential change. And what we finally end up is basically what you see on the right is a kind of a distribution over land of uh, potential change. And you can see that a lot of area basically, we'll see later also this on a map, uh, has a very, very low potential of being, being changed because either it's outside forest or it's in a core forest. Now, what can we do with this stratification? So, oh, next slide, please. Um, let's say the easiest thing to approach this is, so we lay out this systematic grid and we basically trust the algorithms on the lower end of, of this uh, change probability and we expect higher variation on the higher end, and this is where we're going to look at. So we just look at the subset of those, but treat everything uh, the same way, which could, for example, be uh, the case in uh, high forest uh, HFLD countries, uh, where, for example, you have uh, huge areas of forest, and you know that in the core of the forest, probably you won't find any change. And so your change algorithms probably won't detect anything. If you have many algorithms that don't detect anything, you look into the time series, apply certain thresholds, you can be quite sure that nothing's happening. Next slide, please. 
for countries, no, that, that wrong, yeah. Uh, for countries who already maybe established a stratified random sampling and have already existing maps, uh, but end up still with high uncertainties, uh, so they would need to go to intensify to, to lower this inten uh, these uncertainties, which usually happens in the stable class. Uh, now you could think of like running the same kind of things on their existing points or, or their, on their intensified grid and using the same kind of logic to basically not have to look at all of those points from the intensified grid, but just basically at the ones that have the highest likelihood of being changed. Next slide. Um, second usage scenario is basically to use this whole approach as a stratification. And this is what we piloted in Kenya, and Marceline will uh, tell us more about, about the results. But uh, in terms of methodology, so as you see, like this is the histogram we, we ended up with. And on the left hand, you basically see these probabilities on the map. And you see that large amounts of the country, basically one third of the country, uh, have a very low probability of being changed just because they are in the rangelands where you don't see any forest. Uh, now, the higher probability of change, of course, you have in areas where you have forest, because forest change happens in forest, right? And the point here is that when we stratify this, we use a Neyman allocation, we just have a few samples that we actually still place in this low probability stratum. But this is basically just to check that our quality of the map is acceptable. But then we rather look at the high potential uh, change strata uh, to actually get our estimates of change. And next slide, please. And if you look at the strata that are uh, displayed here in this map, uh, you can see like, as opposed, for example, if you create maps for stratified area estimation, you usually get like very narrow classes of change that are actually change. In our case, the strata is a more wide strata and we don't say it's like a change strata, it's like a potential change strata. But the idea really is that within this strata, we capture all of the change so that we exclude omissions. And this is actually how it played out in, uh, in Kenya, that we couldn't find any deforestation or emissions in uh, the lower stratums. Now, you still have a lot of variability, so maybe in your first round of interpretation, you end up still with uncertainties that are not acceptable. But now, if you want to get down these uncertainties, you just have to intensify in this high likelihood strata and don't have to look at the other strata anymore. Uh, next slide, please. Um, third scenario uh, is, again, if, if you already have data and uh, you want to quality control this, you might not want to go through all of the points again, so you want to find some kind of prioritization strategy. And again, you could use the same approach, running all these time series algorithms classified with the data you already interpreted, run a classification and basically see where the algorithms agree with the interpreter and where they don't. And where they don't agree with the uh, with the interpreter, you look at them again. And in this way, and I think uh, Ghana did this uh, uh, for their quality control, uh, you basically again reduce the numbers of points that you have to look at. Next slide, please. Uh, for now, this is still work in progress, but uh, we're having notebooks on GitHub that can be pulled to CPOL and that streamlines these workflows, basically completely automated extraction of all this time series data and running these change algorithms. Uh, it's based on a combination of Google Earth Engine and geospatial uh, Python libraries. Uh, and just to give you an, an idea look of how long it takes, it's about for 300,000 points. You run it for two days, extract the time series, run the change algorithms. And for us at CPOL, because we pay your budget, basically it's, uh, uh, it's about a cost of $10. So to wrap up, uh, we're addressing basically the question how to avoid bias and get to low uncertainties without having to look at all of those points. And next slide. And for this, we propose to use combination of algorithms, basically the kind of a convergence of truth from, from all the information we can get between global data, time series data, algorithms, uh, to avoid basically huge interpretation in areas where we know that there's not a lot of forest or there's no, not a lot of forest dynamics. And basically we're here to gather the feedback from you experts. So looking forward for the discussion. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Andreas. Um, so let's uh, let's keep this in mind. How do we how do we save the energies of everybody so that we don't have to process hundreds of thousand samples? How do we avoid biases, and uh, how do we uh, make robust and precise estimates? Uh, I would like to call now on uh, Merceline uh, to give us the second um, the second uh, presentation. I will try to something about the resolution. I will be a second, Marceline, and if you want to introduce yourself, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Remy. Uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Marceline Ojola. I come from Kenya, and I work with the Directorate of Resource Surveys and Remote Sensing. This is an institution that works very closely with Kenya Forest Service in monitoring forest and generation of the activity data for Red Plus. I'm here with my two Kenyan colleagues, Faith and Peter, from Kenya Forest Service. And I'm going to take you through how we how we applied the ensemble model. Sorry. How we use the sample-based approach in updating our FRL in Kenya. It's gonna come, it's gonna come. Sorry for that. We all know that you can't wrestle with technology. That's the display settings of this thing. Yeah, hold wait. Uh, I open controls and this. Yeah. I move it here. But it's still, it's still locked. Yeah. Yeah. No. Thank you. Thank you all. Let's let's try to. Thank you. I think you. If we can see the middle of the screen is good enough, let's, I guess it's good going. If we can you want to see the whole zoom. screen, join the Zoom in your laptops. <laughs> because it's this screen that's causing the, the problem. Thank you. I'll proceed uh, from there. Like I said, I'm going. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> in my. In my presentation, I'll start with giving a brief introduction of uh, what we did, and then I'll go into how we apply the sampling approach in our work. And then I'll also talk about how we used collect at online in our interpretation, and then I'll have uh, a slide on the results. So uh, Kenya submitted uh, the FRL in the year 2019, and uh, this was through a support uh, in a project uh, that was supported by JICA. And uh, our reference period for the FRL was 2002 to 2018. And it was at national scale with only CO2 being reported. And then uh, we focused on four red plus activities. And then uh, we also had emission factors uh, from uh, pilot national forest inventory, because in our country we have not uh, undertaken a full NFI. And we had a total of 121 plots spread across different forest stratas in the country. So the sample was uh, quite representative for all the forest strata, and therefore calculation or getting the emission factors was also representative. And then for the activity data, we had a project in Kenya that was supported by the Australian government that was called uh, Systems for Land-Based Emission Estimation in Kenya. And uh, through this project, we were able to generate time series data sets wall to wall for the country from the, from, from the year 1990 up to 20, 
uh, 14. And then again, through support from UNDP, we were able to add two more years up to 2018. Therefore, we had a wide range of uh, time series data sets that we could get different data points for the FRL. And uh, the, our activity data for the FRL, we use the map subtraction method. Therefore, when the UNFCCC technical assessment team uh, reviewed our document, we had a number of comments. And one of them that is relevant to this uh, session here was that we needed to, impr to improve on the methods of our AD estimation. And that led us to the IMPRESS project uh, that is supported by the UK Pact and through, through FAO for capacity building. Uh, FAO came in uh, to build uh, the capacity of the technicians or the Kenyan technical team that was working on this. And uh, we've, we had two different sets of training, both online and uh, physical. For the online training, we were focusing mainly on uh, the use of CEPAL. Uh, and the, the key focus was on time series analysis, looking at the different algorithms that Andreas just talked about, how they apply, they, they apply and uh, what, is, uh, what is all that is being looked at by each of, each of these algorithms. And then the total number of uh, people that were trained uh, in this session were 32 participants, 47% of being male and 53 female, and the constitution was from different stakeholders that are working on activities that are relevant to this process. And then the physical, physical training was on Collect Earth Online, and uh, this also took place in Nairobi with the FAO partners coming uh, down physically to train us on the Collect Earth Online, how to use Collect Earth Online to interpret the sample points. And this training now narrowed down to specific technical team that, uh, that were working on the, the whole process of activity data collection. So what formed uh, the reference period for this updating of the FRL, there was an MR, MRV gap assessment that was done. And this informed the reference period to be between 2013 to 2017, and the crediting period to be between 20. 18 to 2022, and therefore the activity data we were to collect them through sample-based area estimation. And then under the response, uh, response design, we maintained the land cover classes that we reported on the former FRL, but then there was also a, a recommendation by the technical assessment team that we needed to separate one of our forest strata, that is the coastal and mangrove that we had combined together. We, need, we needed to separate the coastal alone and the mangroves alone, because there was a feeling that the emission factors in these two different forests were different. Then again, we also separated another forest strata that we had combined, that's the mountain and the western rain forest. And then in our interpretation at the Collect Earth Online, we had a decision tree, which was informing whatever change that was, the whatever point that was being interpreted interpreted and we had a decision tree that was guiding us all the way up until you reach the particular red plus activity for instance if it's a point in 2021 you look at is it, is it a forest yes is it a is it a forest no if it's a forest you go all the way up to where it will tell you whether it's an, a sustainable forest management or degradation or stable forest or deforestation and same also for the non-forest uh, category. And then under the impress uh, data collection for the activity data, just like Andreas had, had explained, we had a, a two kilometer grid for change validation. And uh, this two kilometer grid gave us a total of uh, about 150,000 points or to be specific, 149,460 sample points. And then these uh, sample points after the, after the, sum, uh, after the algorithms that uh, were to identify the change what was done, we had uh, a total of 7,313 7, points of change that were now to be interpreted uh, visually by the technical team. Uh, I know you've seen this uh, diagram severally, but it's what is showing uh, practically how the sample-based uh, approach was in our country. 
uh, we, we first started with the some the, the 150,000 sample points which uh, through time series and the various algorithms uh, we narrowed down to 100 and uh, I mean we narrowed down to the 7,313 samples and then uh, the, the the algorithms were looking at the probability of change of each of the sample points that we had so the points that were relatively stable there was no interpretation done but the points with the possible uh, areas of change were interpreted and then again the points with possible areas of change were diff were stratified into different uh, stratas and as you can see uh, in the map here we have the the first area which is basically our rangeland area having very few points and then we have the other the next strata with the light blue color and then we have the third strata and th these are post, uh, th these are basically the areas of uh, the high potential areas in our countries where we have different activities with various anthropogenic activities going on and then we, the visual interpretation was done to the 7000 points and this pro whole process is, is iterative in that uh, when we reach the visual interpretation point and then the point seemed maybe to undergo another process of uh, analysis, then it's able to go back and then do the probability analysis point, and then it, go, it goes back again to the visual interpretation point. And then during interpretation, uh, we had a sample grid or a sample design that was uh, developed for our country. And this design was considering the definition of our forest. And therefore we had a 70 by 70 uh, square grid to, to cater for our 0 0.5 hectare forest de definition. And then inside the, this grid, we had again different 49 uh, points to be interpreted. And these again catered for the minimum, uh, minimum value for our forest definition, which is at 15%. And then during the, the interpretation, we also had a set of different additional data sets that were helping us to interpret the points. For example, in the in the in the in the, in the collect uh, at online uh, uh, grid, we had planet data from NICFI, that, and these data sets is a monthly composites from the year 2016 to 2021 at five meter resolution. We are also able to use Sentinel data, uh, which is also a, math, a monthly composite 2015 to 2022 at 10 meter resolution. And then we were also able to access Google Earth Engine, which is also having time series data sets, uh, both Landsat and Sentinel. Then we were also able to access Google Earth Pro, which has very high resolution data sets for the interpretation. And then we also had another uh, special support, the GeoDash. And in the GeoDash, we had different graphs showing the NDVI trends and the NDFI trends, and also Landsat composites, and later on, uh, even the SAD data was was also added to aid the interpretation. Thank you. Uh, with all this uh, process also, <laughs> the thank you was for Amy. <laughs> that was for Amy. With all this, we also had quality check and quality control going on and a number of issues just uh, as is listed there. And then I also wanted to show you uh, part of the results that we have. The analysis is being finalized, but this is just part of the results that we already have after using the sample-based approach in our activity data or in our updating of our FRL. And with that, I say thank you. <laughs>
So I'll be giving you a background to what we've done so far from the FCPF process now entering into arts, arts trees. Our landscape is very, very dynamic. Um, those that have been to Africa and or West Africa, particularly Ghana, we have a very mosaic landscape, cropland, forest land, everything mixed up. And it's so difficult to tease out what particular land use per the mapping unit that you are working on. And for this, um, we try to use the change maps to stratify our, our um, points that we had to collect. But there were very low um, agreements between different algorithms. So we try the GFC, the BFAS, the land trender. And as you can see, these are very, very um, low accuracies. And for that, we couldn't um, base on these um, land change maps to be our stratifier. So we, we compare the systematic sample to stratified area, area estimates. And we, we see that the more the area, the points were intensified, the accuracies rather um, get uh, better. And the, there's no really um, change using the strata and the land use as a, a base for, for the classification. So more rather using the sampling would, would be good. And we rather intensified, as the first speaker said, intensification should be high so that we can capture the different um, minute changes within the landscape. So we rather had to intensify all of our plots. And you could see that also with, with the intensification, the accuracy also improves. Okay. Sorry, guys. With intensification, the, the accuracy also improves. And the precision is also accurate. Yeah, so this, we already had a, a QAQC process in place where we have people also doing the double blind assessment of the points. And we had 79% of interpreter agreement. And the, these are the different um, plots that is shown all across um, the, the Cocoa Forest program area for the FCPF. And now to trees, we, we see that uh, we have to get more than one interpreter must analyze the reference data and also have an agreement with the algorithm. And the majority agreement must be used for the final reported data. And this is where the extra confidence comes about because it's not just a result of people interpreting using um, images they are seeing on the screen, but also the algorithm supporting us to know that is there any agreement between what people have seen and what the agreement um, the or algorithm is also seeing. And because of that, we are able to identify the discrepancies between remote sensing data and what also people have identified as plots. And this also will reduce the number of plots that will need to be reinterpreted. And that is the essence of the assemble. And this has greatly helped Ghana's process. As you can see from the results that we had as forest plots, there's only um, a few change where the, there's a lot of stable uh, stable plots that is confirmed also by the algorithm and rather the higher um, disagreements between what we classified as forest change between what we classified and what the algorithm also stated but for all of this 114 plots of disagreement and um, compared to the 143 disagreement on on what we classified as change and what the algorithm rather said is stable and this will rather bring all the points down that we had to reinterpret, even though we would have gone ahead to look at all of these points again. And this is where the algorithm becomes very essential for this process. And for over 8,000 plots, we are only going to have 3% of that to reinterpret. I'm having about 97 agreements already with it, but what we interpreted and what the algorithm also said. And for now, Ghana is also assessing um, very high resolution imagery from University of Maryland to rather look at also the reference data, maybe if prehistorical what we are using wasn't that strong to give us good accuracies. And for this, currently, uh, my colleagues back in, in Ghana are always already starting with a reanalysis of the 281 plots. And you could see that of the classified plots as non forest, only 17 of all the stable plots identified by the algorithm as high forest um, change probabilities, and which is also a good indication that uh, there has been a good job already done. And these are the um, 
differences we, we've seen with um, the FCPF process, the reference level that we had, and also with this um, algorithm coming in to help us reassess the, pl the plots, the average deforestation area for trees crediting um, level. And the good news is that all of these processes supported also by FAO has yielded positive results for Ghana where we've been able to already go through the third party verification for our first monitoring report that we submitted to FCPF and our first or our premier program, the Ghana Cocoa Forest Red Plus program, which has also yielded about $4.8 million for the country by um, reducing 972,000 plus um, million and thousand CO2 equivalents. So thank you and thank you to FAO and to all the people behind the, also the algorithms for the good job done and we, all, we keep improving. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jacob. Um, so we actually, we are actually on time uh, and we've been keeping up. Uh, so thank you very much for, for getting quick. Um, like I said before, I would like that we keep questions that we have regarding the sampling designs, regarding the approach that is proposed to actually use and assemble uh, data on this. But if there's any one question, quick cl clarification for the countries, please, like we can have a break. Not, oh, there we go. No, now we have like four questions on the room. Go ahead, do your first. So Andrea said in the beginning, just more on the methodology is how many, sam how many stable points should you ideally check? You said we'll check a couple. In, in Kenya, it didn't sound like they checked many. And then in, in Ghana, it was some. So my question is, do we have an indicator of how many points, percentage or whatever points is a good idea to check these sample, these stable sample points? Because as you know, that could be a source of criticism that we don't check enough sample, enough stable points in the stable class. Wait, 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 we're going to take those questions and answer them later. There's going to be plenty of those that are similar. I know they're coming, so I don't want to have this right now. But we take the questions and we put them down and we'll answer them. I promise. So there was Muri, uh, Danilo, gentleman over there. And uh, well, it was Muri first. Let's take the questions and then we'll answer them. Uh, thank you. Uh, it was a question for, for Kenya. <clears throat> you said you, you uh, identified the, the low confidence uh, points, the points that were classified with low confidence. So then how did you use that information uh, in, your, in, your, in your analysis uh, design? And then I didn't understand something with the, with the Ghana. Uh, you said you reinterpreted the points where they disagreed with the map. So I, 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 wouldn't, I, I didn't understand because usually the points should be the, the, the validation points that refer to the truth. So when they disagree with the map, it's probably the map that is, that is wrong. But maybe, maybe I didn't understand clearly. Thank you. A question for Andreas and Marcelina. Um, when we did the study on the dryland forest, one hot spot of deforestation was actually on the border between Kenya and uh, Somalia, where due to the humanitarian crisis, the conflict, there are millions of people moving and uh, cutting down the dry forests, which actually are in Kenya. In the map that you show, these forests doesn't show up at all. And actually, you were reporting this as a um, rangeland. And uh, in the 7,000 points that you validate visually, no one of them was uh, there. So how do you handle the situation like in a country like Kenya, where you have humid forests, dry forests, which require, from a methodological point of view, two different completely approach? Thanks for the question. Um, yes. Wait. We'll take them later. Go ahead. Thank you. No, I won't take all questions because we're going to have plenty. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you for your presentation, Olof. Uh, my question goes to Andreas and the Marcelene and the, for the Kenya. Uh, you tested the, the assembled machine learning algorithms, but, but the machine learning individually they have their own positive and the negative uh, sides. Uh, did you see individually what is achieved by each algorithm? And you seen the agreement between those uh, 
uh, algorithms why you go into the assembled machine learning algorithm Okay, thank you. Uh, my question is uh, for uh, Marceline, uh, Kenya, maybe. Uh, I think you assessed degradation, deforestation, this changes all the gains in afforestation, reforestation, or restoration. So if that is the case, uh, how did you arrive at the area of each of these with their uncertainties? For example, degraded forest, how many, how much area, the area is how much, and the uncertainty for each of these. And the other is maybe in Ethiopia, oh, we faced, we always faced uh, a problem of interpretation when this co confusing land uses, like uh, from annual cropland, if there is a change to grassland, this is always in Ethiopia problematic when we interpret and vice versa. And the other is forest land into shrublands or shrublands into forest lands. How, how did you manage such changes in your collector's online analysis? Thank you. Last, last one from Sandro. And then we we're gonna have an, another round of questions, but... Uh... I may not have understood well the presentation, so it's a very simple question. With the sampling, so when you do the sampling and you do the reinterpretation, my understanding is that you correct the statistics that you derive from the map in terms of area and area changes. No, you don't change the map, you just adjust the statistic. This is the question. Yes or no? That was a great question because it's, it's an easy answer. Uh, so I'd, I'd like everybody to keep the, those questions in mind, but in summary we have, how do we, how do we quantify the amount of stable points that we need to interpret? How do we deal with different landscapes and when we have dry and mix of, of humid forests and that will require different methodologies? How, what do we do for agreement between interpreters and how do we manage with uh, tricky transitions to grasslands or uh, or um, other types let's keep those in mind we get and but let's keep those some questions for after we're not answering now so i'd like to make a break on those uh, statistics methodological point of views on how do we do our estimation i promise that we will keep 45 minutes to that afterwards i just want to give the floor to Anne because otherwise the discussion is going to eat the time we're just going to have a quick eight minutes uh, presentation on the study that uh, uh, this one. Can we see that properly? So just a little breath and then we talk about those things. Hello, good afternoon to all. My name is Anna Brantom. I work uh, at FAO in the Global Forest Risk Assessment uh, Program. Uh, I must warn you, uh, some people might be frustri frustrated about it or they're relieved, but I will not go to technical details in this presentation. <laughs> but I will present you for the first time uh, the result of a study that we conducted with many colleagues in-house and it's really a joint effort and collaboration between different divisions across FAO, uh, including the agricultural division and the forestry divisions. And also, I must acknowledge that behind all this uh, data that I will show you, there is also the tremendous effort of the countries uh, in the interpretation of the data for the Global Remote Sensing Survey 2020. So this study, is also about a global sample-based area estimates, as we are still in the topic, uh, but it's about an application at the global level to understand what are the drivers of deforestation and to go more in depth also about the agricultural drivers of deforestation. And the study, as we called it, is how much do large-scale and small-scale farming contribute to global deforestation. It was uh, implementing the framework of the global forest resource assessment, but also 
under the initiative of turning the tide of deforestation to deforestation. And here you can see also the authors, the main authors of this study. In this study, what we did is we expanded on the work to conducti conducting during the Global Forest Risk Assessment 2020 Remote Sensing Survey that some of you may know already. It's a, a global survey of forest cover changes looking at two periods in time, 2000 to 2010, 2010 to 2018. And it was based on 400,000 samples across the world and interpreting using a collector online application. It was a stratified sampling design uh, based on the Hansen data set to assess uh, tree cover changes and there was stratification applied on that uh, based on ecological zones and the probability or the possibility of uh, tree cover changes. It involved 800 experts nationally to do the interpretation from 126 countries and the results of this study were released at the World Forestry Congress in uh, last uh, year, in 2022. Uh, here you can uh, find also the cover of the publication and I encourage you also to go to the FRA website uh, if you have not done it uh, to uh, uh, consult this publication because there are a lot of data on how the forests are changing over time by biome, ecozone and uh, uh, at the global level. So what we did uh, for this study, so we did an assessment of the drivers of deforestation using Earth observation satellite imagery and we looked at all the forest in 2000 or 2010 according to the satellite imagery which then were transformed into uh, into different land uses okay i think this is not the right presentation but that's fine <laughs> okay <laughs> okay uh, so basically land use in uh, 2018 that was considered as uh, cropland uh, was considered as cropland expansion as deforestation driver a forest that was converted to livestock gra uh, to grassland was considered uh, being uh, impacted by uh, livestock grazing a forest converted to settlement uh, was indicated as uh, for urban or infrastructure development under the conversion of forest to water, then uh, the drivers uh, that was assessed there is uh, uh, the dam construction of change in water course. And for all the other conversion of forest to other land use, then it was other dr drivers and mainly uh, severe deg degradation affecting natural resources. A conversion of forest to have another land use, I just give you a reminder, is for FAO considered as a deforestation. So these are the results of the survey in terms of deforestation driver between 2000 and 2018. So the result allowed assessing what were the main direct driver of deforestation and showed that agriculture was by far the main drivers of deforestation. It accounted about 90% of the deforestation worldwide since 2000, which was much more than what the previous study were saying. From these agricultural drivers, they were about 50% due to government expansion and 38.5% due to livestock grazing. 7% of this uh, conversion of forest uh, to other land uh, was also due to the expansion of oil palm. This global figure of 88.5 really can uh, hide a diversity of situations uh, uh, leading to deforestation. While well, it was very important also to understand what were the dynamics of land use behind this 88%, in particular in the view of designing more efficient policies. So what we did, we tried to divide this 88.5 into different process of deforestation linked to agriculture. 
So for both uh, the conversion of forest to cropland and the conversion of forest to grassland, what we did is we divided the process between small scale farming and large scale farming. We know that several studies have already uh, assessed, for instance, the impact of commercial agriculture, industrial agriculture. Uh, but uh, in this case, uh, we also try to clarify the terminology and uh, use some categories that could be also relevant from a remote sensing point of view of what we can see from satellite imagery. So those uh, large scale farming categories and small scale farming were defined uh, mainly according to criteria related to the investment of the production capacities and also, uh, also the, the expansion of uh, the areas. So large scale farming are all those agricultural activities involving industrial and, and medium to high technology production processes covering large areas and involving significant capital investment machinery or infrastructure. While small scale Farming covers all the act farming activities that apply non-industrial methods, low technology production process, they expand over limited area, and they have the labor force as the main investment. So the methodology that uh, was applied to each sample of the FRA Remote Sensing Survey 2020, where we had identified deforestation since 2000. So we were looking at each of the samples, and for each of the samples, either of, of conversion from forest to cropland or to uh, grassland, to livestock grazing, we identified a set of uh, criteria, geospatial characteristics, to, in order to quantify how much was going to large scale, was associated to large scale farming, and how much were associated to small scale farming. So those criteria are the landscape, landscape context, looking for instance uh, at the proximity to big roads, uh, to cities, uh, and also looking at the fragmentation of the landscape and the forest. The speed of clearing, the field size, of course, very important. The field boundaries, if they were regular or not regular, the shape, uh, if we had a plot that were uh, continuous, uh, circular. Uh, the field patterns also was an important uh, criteria and the presence of infrastructure and particular dwellings and uh, farming infrastructures. And the result of the study gave us, uh, there were two main results. Uh, the first one being what criteria are more relevant to identify large scale from small scale farming through this approach for each region and according to the different uh, uh, production system, livestock or cropland. And the second type of result was a, a share, the share of uh, uh, large scale versus small scale farming involved in contributing to deforestation globally and by region. So what are the results that I'm going to present you today? Uh, first, what we know uh, from that is that during worldwide, during the period 2000 to 2018, most of the conversion of forest to cropland uh, or grassland occurred in the context of uh, small-scale farming. It's uh, the uh, small-scale farming accounted for 68 percent of the uh, conversion of forest uh, to agricultural land. Um, from this 68 percent, 40 percent was uh, uh, linked to small-scale cropland and 28% uh, to small-scale livestock. This uh, small-scale farming, it account uh, in terms of hectares, the estimates uh, gave uh, 103 million hectares of uh, forest uh, deforested losses uh, associated to small-scale farming practices. 
If we look at uh, the distinction between cropland expansion and livestock grazing, uh, what the study found is that the cropland expansion is associated to forest, is, is associated to 71% of the case uh, by small scale farming. Uh, while for livestock grazing, here also uh, the small scale farming uh, was uh, the prominent uh, uh, cause and uh, was associated to 64% of the area deforested for agriculture. Oh, okay. One minute. Okay. This is just to give you also uh, the distribution of where this happened and uh, what we see that the results uh, varied uh, from region to region. So small-scale farming was linked to most agricultural-driven deforestation in all regions, but at different degrees. And it represents, for instance, a share of 97% of agricultural-driven deforestation in Africa, 65% in North and Central America, 59% in Asia, and 52% in South America. And the highest share of forest loss associated to large scale farming were found in South America, where 30% of the agriculture driven deforestation was associated to large scale livestock production system, as well as in Asia, uh, with the 38% linked to large scale crop production and mainly for all palm plantations. The conclusions are that we have from the study is that uh, it's an efficient methodology and it's replicable. Uh, so we did a quality assessment and we found out that there was uh, uh, about 90% of the, the sample that were reinterpreted in the same way uh, by different interpreters. Um, we found out also that adding parameters uh, to the field sites to define large scale versus uh, small scale agriculture is very useful. So we need to combine different indicators, uh, special characteristics, in order to be able to really classify between these uh, two different uh, uh, agricultural categories. And this was particularly important in the case of livestock. What we found is that these uh, results are aligned also to some other data from other studies that show the important uh, contribution of small-scale farming to food production. Uh, some studies show that, uh, for instance, 70% of the cocoa production is linked to small holders, 73% of the coffee, and 20 to 30% of the palm oil. So it's in line with these, uh, these findings. And also, the studies show that we need to strengthen the efforts to address the weaknesses of the current production systems when designing strategies against deforestation. And we need to consider also the strong concomitant needs, uh, in particular food security, decent income, and secure tenure rights uh, when addressing uh, the deforestation issue. Therefore, also, uh, therefore, um, this study finding can support more tailored policy making. Uh, and we can also use this kind of approach to be uh, to develop also more fine-tuned uh, approach even at the different levels. The study is released today, so you can uh, download it uh, from the FAO website, as particularly on the FRA website. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anne, for this, uh, for this great uh, presentation showing how uh, also those approaches can be used to derive uh, more qualitative information on, uh, on, uh, on drivers. That was great. So yeah, check out on the, check out on the link and uh, maybe we'll share the link also on the, on the chat. Uh, I've seen that there are also um, some very interesting comments in the, in the chat and uh, maybe uh, we will speak them out. But before, I would like to check if Steve Stemmen from um, uh, University of New York Syracuse is online to give us a, a brief uh, wrap up uh, feeling about those different approaches. Steve, are you online? I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Floor is yours. Okay. Can you? 
and we can see your slides. Okay, and let's see if I can get it to the slideshow. Okay, I will try to keep this very brief so we can get to the important uh, discussion questions. So this is a bit of a transition from the good applications that you've been hearing about into the discussion part. We've heard about many different decisions and as far as the sample-based area estimation through the applications that were presented earlier. And I think it's helpful to have specific criteria to, to guide our decision-making and to attach these decision criteria to specific components of the methodology. So the criteria can be statistical and practical, and in a sense, statistical criteria should also be practical. And we've already heard about these components of sample-based area estimation. So just a quick review, there's the sampling design and the response design. The response design is providing our best available determination of the condition. And we want to use these particular components and connect those to the different criteria that I listed earlier. So we had, for example, today, uh, an issue where we would want to evaluate a decision would be use of the ensemble classification. It can be used in the sampling design in the form of stratification, but we also heard about it being used as part of the response design, possibly to provide the reference data, but also as a quality assurance device. So when we are evaluating decisions such as the, the role of the ensemble classification, we want to connect these features of the sampling design and response design at the top of the, of the slide to these specific properties of area estimators. In this case, I'm listing the statistical properties. So what are sources of bias and variance that come in from the two different components, the sampling design and the response design? And that will help us in terms of thinking about uh, certain decisions we're making in terms of the sample-based area estimation. So let's start with bias. And this is kind of a review of, of what the potential sources are. From the sampling design, we usually don't worry about bias because we can rely on sampling theory to give us unbiased estimators or ones with small bias. And the issue of bias is essentially coming out of the response design, that there are non-random errors in the reference classification, or another way to think about it, is imbalance between omission and commission errors. So we would like to have ways of, of doing an assessment of that bias. The question already came up, for example, of how many points would you have to check in, in that stable class to make sure you're really not still having omission errors. So essentially, we we want to do what would be an accuracy assessment of the reference data. In terms of variance, there are two sources. It can also come from the sampling. So different samples would yield different area estimates. And we've talked about reducing the sampling variance either by increasing the sample size, which we know is costly, or using map information through stratification or the model-assisted estimation. Model-assisted estimation has already come up in, in the chat from Christoph. We also have variants coming from the, the response design. So that type of measurement or response variance would enter, for example, if we have two interpreters looking at the same sample unit and they disagree, that would be another source of variability. So we would also like to reduce that as much as possible. And that's what a lot of the training and coordination efforts are designed to do. We need to assess or estimate the variance because the square root of the variance is the standard error. And we input that into the confidence intervals that we need. 
And we can think of the total variance as being the sum of that sampling variance plus this response variance. Now, typically what we only estimate is the sampling variance, and we have standard formulas for doing that. Generally, to this point, we are not incorporating response variance, and that opens up another very big issue. We do have methods that we can start to do that, uh, so, but it's not something that's part of uh, current practice. So as we proceed to the discussion and the challenging issues that are going to come up there, I think it's helpful to keep in mind that we have certain criteria that we can think about, and these criteria associate with specific components of the sampling design and response design. So typically, sampling design and estimator issues will focus on the variance criterion, and the response design questions and issues will focus on the, the bias criterion. So we're trying to find good but not perfect solutions to these problems, realizing that there are always trade-offs of the choices we make, specifically in terms of these criteria. So I hope that helps as a bit of a lead in into the discussion, and I'm sure there will be a lot of interesting questions to come up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve, for those, uh, those great comments and uh, points of wisdom regarding the fact that we are tackling a difficult subject and that trade-offs are unnecessary. I, I really appreciate that. Um, we, okay, we don't have 45 minutes for questions, but we do have 25 minutes for questions if we stay within time. So I would like to open the floor to the first set of answers, and then we're gonna take a couple of questions, but uh, I can also see the hand. So maybe our panelists wanna take the questions that were addressed uh, earlier on um, maybe the first one on, on stable, necessary points of stable. Andreas, you wanna take that? Uh, yes, I can take that. And maybe I group it uh, with the question also of Danilo. Um, I mean, as pointed out, and also like now by Steve Steeman, and I remember also earlier this week, there was a slide from Maria Sanz in the introductory session that basically you, you need to find a trade off between accuracy and, 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 um, and precision. And this is basically what we try to tackle. And also, as Steve pointed out, like, what is the criteria? So we also have to uh, take into account uh, cost and resources. Um, so if you ask me for a number of points that you should have in this uh, strata, I couldn't give you a clear answer. It really depends on the case. That's also why we kind of presented this usage scenarios because it depends on the country uh, and it uh, depends on the circumstances of the project, also of the resource you have available. Um, in terms of Kenya, the example from Kenya and uh, the trilands. So first point is like the map you saw is actually the two kilometer grid, but it's like so small that you cannot see e each and every single point. So some of the points have been in the, uh, included uh, also in those areas and have been interpreted. Uh, I, I cannot tell you how much now. On the other hand, um, we have, uh, we, we use uh, Landsat data and it's known that Landsat data in these areas has problems to take forest, but we're willing to bring this method forwards, for example, using Sentinel-1 data that can detect woody vegetation um, and integrate this. I think one advantage of this approach is since you keep with this grid, you basically uh, can also go back in time. So you're consistent and you can update uh, when new data or new methods coming in uh, to basically uh, uh, also update your old results so to stay, stay consistent over time. Um, yeah. Thank you, Andreas. Um, there was a question for Ghana. Did you get that one? Do you want to take that, Jacob? Yeah, thank you. So the disagreement with the map and which one we interpreted. So no, the answer is no. We rather reinterpret the points where there are disagreements, both change and stable. So for points that um, the interpreter said it is forest, but it's not, 
and also the point that we said it was stable, but the algorithm also said, said it's not. So we combined, the, so from the presentation, you see that we had 143 of um, points that we had classified as um, change, but the algorithm said not. And points that we said were stable, 114, but the algorithm said otherwise, plus the 17 of the other um, classes that we had to add to this. So it's all of the disagreements between interpreter and algorithm that we had to um, reassess. Thank you very much. I believe there was a question for, for Kenya regarding the different types of vegetations on, or the, the border between Somalia and Kenya, uh, major things. Marcelino, Andres, do you want to take that, either one of you? I already addressed, I said, like, I grouped this, so. But you want to add something? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Danilo, for the question. Uh, like Andrea, Andrea has said, uh, it's not like in the rangeland areas we didn't have any points to interpret. We also had some points to interpret within that uh, rangeland region, but it's just that there were not as many as in the high potential area. And then there was also uh, another question from uh, Ethiopia with the interpretation of different land uses, which are a bit confusing. And uh, the answer I would like to give you is uh, yes, that was even a challenge with us uh, for the first uh, activity that we did because we used map, map subtraction method. And uh, always map subtraction is a challenge because you will always find that there's no perfect pixel map in this regard. And therefore, when you do a uh, subtraction, the, the, these changes, the errors tend to be compounded. And uh, that is why uh, when we, we went to the sampling based uh, approach, and uh, like we all know right now, a number of standards are very, very particular on accuracy and precision. Those are very key factors that are being considered. And this is uh, partly addressed by the sampling approach. And then uh, there was also another question on how we were able to look at the area of each activity under Red Plus, if I got you right. Uh, I did show a decision tree that we were using to arrive at each Red Plus activity. And then in our sampling design, the, the, square, the, square, uh, the, the square design for interpretation uh, was finally used to be able to give us the the area of each uh, of each activity data of course looking at all the stratas that we were interpreting that we were interpreting thank you thank you marceline um i don't know so i have a doubt now sandro that your question was actually not answered <laughs> <That's> <laughs> you, nobody wants to take Sandro's question uh, there was also the question of the regime Go ahead. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, so, so you were asking about the importance of the different single algorithms. The individual algorithm you used and the assembled algorithm you used. What is, what is improved using this assembled algorithm? So, so I think it, it works differently, as you might imagine, because you, you don't really look at the accuracy of the algorithms. I mean, usually with this change algorithms, what you need to do, you need to find a threshold on your own, right? So it, it's some model fitted to a time series, and then you have some deviation, and, and you would uh, uh, try to find a threshold. In this case, it's basically the, the machine learning that uh, learns from the training data where to set this threshold, and then you assess your final accuracy. But since, you, since you're working with probability, you don't get a discrete classification in this sense, because so everything is then handled by the, by the sampling at the end. So it's, it's not that you get a real map where you access accuracy in a classical way. It's just a way of stratifying, basically. Okay, Sandro, then um luca then ethiopia i'm sorry i forgot your name sandro do you want to 
repeat your question or I understand uh, it's very simple question I understand that with this uh, uh, sampling plot with the data you adjust the statistic that you derive from the map you don't adjust the map this is the simple question am, am I right or am I misunderstanding That's... okay so may, maybe we should say we don't we don't have a map um okay but do you want to take that yeah basically no we don't we don't on on the approach that has been proposed here and that kenya has used that ghana has also used that we have examples of in cote d'ivoire and there's actually a quite extensive comment from christophe so maybe we can read that out afterwards the the, the database consists of points and we have all these algorithms and this information that is being collated together and that we use but we don't change any of this uh, of the of the um, the change probability that we use for stratification for instance is thesis but it's just a temporary measure and doesn't show out in the end we have the, the point system and we make the statistics based on the point system go ahead Nekwa. It, um, Perhaps, uh, per, yeah, perhaps I can shed some light uh, as someone who uh, went through the difficult journey that you guys are embark being embarked at this point uh, and, and a little bit of context. We're working with one of the uh, um, FCPF countries. Uh, they present their first monitoring report. It has huge uncertainties. And then we try to work with the country and deliver support to see how those uncertainties can be tackled. Then we realize that the country is working with FAO and its team looking at this methodology. And we don't want to generate parallel work streams, right? So the idea is that we want to try to reduce the amount of work that the country has to do in order to deliver for either reporting framework that it's working with. So what that entails is that we need to understand what's going on. So the first thing was understanding what this uh, probability distribution talked about and how it was put together. And the first thing is that you, you understand that there's no map. What you're doing is a total evidence approach. You could have maps derived from different algorithms, but you also look at all kinds of remote sensing based change data that you can you put your hands on, et cetera. And based on that, you generate a, a probability distribution of change. Basically, you try to identify where it's more likely that the world's change and where it's not. Andreas, you correct me if I'm wrong, because this has been my journey and I haven't been able to, to realize that. And then what you do is you do a cluster analysis. So you split the landscape into strata that are low probability of change, moderate, and then high probability of change, and that should inform your sampling design. And uh, uh, one of the things that uh, was this goes back and forth is which allocation uh, approach do you use? It's a statistically based allocation approach. In this country specifically, we had money for 4,000 points. The, 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 um, homoge the yeah, homogeneous, no, the um, systematic grid had 46,000 points. And there was no money, no time to analyze the 46,000 points. So you have to prioritize. So you are, okay, I have money for 4,000. How do I allocate my sample size for all three strata? And that's, that's what we did. And then with the support of uh, other consultants and the work team and so forth, the, the 4,000 samples were assessed with a two round assessment for quality control, et cetera. And then based on the interpretation of those samples, you estimate the area. There was a question about how do you know how much area is represented by a sample? When you do the cluster analysis of the probability map, you have the size of the stratum. So if it's a sample that falls in the low probability stratum, then you know how much area each sample is going to represent. If it's the moderate, the other one, and then the, the, the change. What this does is that you do a more dense sampling assessment in the change stratum, which is the tri -tool. Now, this doesn't solve the problem of detectability. Danilo, uh, his question has to do that some instances, the algorithms that we use with the remote sensing data do not detect the change that we're trying to, to, to do. But this, not a, this is not a silver bullet approach. This is not trying to pretend a perfect solution. What this is helping us is to optimize the sample allocation and the analysis. 
We have worked with countries that have 270,000 samples and it takes them nine months to analyze the, the samples. And with FCPF, you have 45 days to deliver your monitoring report after the end of your monitoring period, right? So when you consider all those things, this is an approach that we need to test. And we tested it for this country and with well estimated uncertainties and things like that, we got results that we feel comfortable with. Are they perfect? No. Um, that's it. That's, 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 that's our, our adventure uh, with this methodology. I'm not going to disclose the country, but because the Mipomori to report is not out there yet, but uh, yeah, there you go. Thank you very much for the reality check, Naikoa. Um, okay, is that an answer to Naikoa's? Do you want to go, on? go ahead? Go ahead. Sandra. in the stable like you know i do my sampling pre-sampling i don't know how you call five percent of the of the points are not stable five, let's say five, five percent okay then what i do with this five percent okay that's i didn't get what yeah. do i do with the five percent so you do can I propagate this error because you don't change this you the, you the, can the, propagate yeah you, you just pro propagate this five percent yeah you propagate yeah. it or you can the other thing that you can do is you can use the, the information of the interpretation of the points to improve to, your clustering. To yeah. do again the clustering, to do again the clustering. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> Muri says it's cheating. <laughs> Let the world know. <laughs> I, th I think it's, it's, the right, it, it's a good terminology. That's the terminology we can, we can speak about a lot, but it's, it's not cheating, it's trade-off. <laughs> There's going to be some trade-off to be found between allocation of resources and the precision that is necessary and, and reality checks on, on different landscapes. So there was a question from Luca. I saw Alfonso's hand, I saw uh, Javier's hand, and I saw over, over there too. And in theory, we have another five minutes. So please make your question concise yes. and I, answerable. I have, <laughs> okay. I have many questions, but I will do one. Um, so it's great. Um, it's a question about transparency because a systematic sampling we know that is not perfect, but but we know exactly why that point was selected. So if you get to put yourself in the shoes of a person who has to assess the transparency accuracy of this data, so what type of data a country should provide um, to allow the assessment of the transparency? So for example, why that area was not sampled or not? So. Is it something that you think is, is easy? So can we share the algorithm, the probability risk map? So just, just to get some reflection on that. One, one, one quick answer to that is that this is something that we thought about uh, uh, previously and uh, uh, it is part of the learning by doing process. One, the solution we found in one exercise that we did and we support was to use a random seed for the systematic grid. So you, you randomize the, the starting point of the systematic grid. Of course, you are a statistician, more statistician than, than I am. So if, if or, or I mean, there's a lot of gurus of statistics here. So if you come up with better solutions, please let us know because we're trying to deal with that, yes. Yeah, just, just to add, so you, you can reproduce everything as like in every step where there's a random element, you basically set a seat and you can basically reproduce everything. You can also see like the single algorithms, how they behave. Of course, like this would be a lot of work for, for a reviewer, but you, you can also get like the final map of change probability and see like, as for example, Danilo pointed out, oh, maybe there's an area missing and this should maybe be then addressed in the next round, uh, maybe adding new data. Because also if you think of ensemble approach, now we're using just one data source and we're using a bunch of algorithms, but ideally you would want to have maybe more data sources. For Kenya, for example, we went back to 2013, I think. So we, we could just use Landsat, but maybe in the future we can add planet data or Sentinel-1 data. And let's say also from, from the input data that comes in kind of provide this ensemble. And maybe on the aspect of cheating <laughs> or trade-off. So the way it's thought is, is, is kind of an iterative approach. So you would start out with, if you have, like Nikoa says, like you have 4,000 points. So in, in this case, how it played out, you start maybe with 500 points 
that you use to train your algorithm and to get like this change probability. Now you look at your map and you say, am I happy with that map? Can I use that for stratification? Mm, maybe not. Maybe I should add some more points because I know like there and there, like it doesn't capture what I want to see actually. So I add new points to the training until I'm kind of happy with the map that kind of this, this stratification that it comes up uh, kind of represents what you want. And only then you start to select samples that you really use then for the final estimation step. And, uh, and from there on, yeah, you shouldn't, you shouldn't change your sample, your, your boundaries anymore of your stratification. Uh, from there on, you can only intensify. But as shown, like in, yeah, or that. Yeah. So, so we're coming to an end. There's plenty of comments in the chat. I would like to just underline that one, that maybe the approach shown by Ghana and Kenya, recently implemented in Cote d'Ivoire, could be further developed to combine the change probability maths in a model, assisted regression approach. Uh, this is maybe something we, we will uh, have discussions about in the coming month. So uh, what we will do is gather all those questions and share with um, somewhere on the on the GFY proceedings, or I don't know what, what they will be there, but we'll make sure we make those available. Is there any final, really, one minute question to be answered? Otherwise, I suggest that we bring it to the coffee break because we have an, another hour and a half to be like, uh, no, half hour we have before the next plenary. We can go overboard a little bit. Go ahead, please. But feel free to escape if you think you've had enough. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that I think this, this method for the quality assessment and quality control is, is really good. That is something that a lot of countries that we work with will be very happy to use. And I was just wanted to point out that for the reproduce, reproducibility and transparency of the process, I would use a systematic global grid that you can pick plots from and apply a systematic approach all the time without using any randomness on the on the process because then you will be open to this kind of of comment or criticism that you are maybe not um, playing straight with the data so um, i don't know if maybe i can answer to that one alfonso because basically all the so you have the cochrane formula to look at the necessary density with a priori information and we do reality checks also on this using global products and basically, every time we come back to change that are currently being on maps of 30 meter resolution gets captured at a one kilometer grid. So maybe we should just follow your advice and go for a global one kilometer grid and just like forget the rest. But um, just to say that we're probably not completely off because we are basically everywhere using that, that size in the end. We just redo the calculation, but we, we keep grabbing the same things. <laughs> Question can from I, the can gentleman. I, yeah. Can I add one thing yeah. to that, uh, Alfonso? Uh, so what we suggest in this in this Jupyter notebooks that are up is basically to use DGG grid, which is the same as, as Fra is using with standard parameters. And it even has the advantage that if you figure out later that you need to intensify, you are basically hierarchical. So basically points that you already interpreted, you don't have to, like it's not a complete new sampling design, you just intensify it but you make sure that your points already have been interpreted so that is standardized but there's actually another a lot of random things inside the the full process uh but always you can set a random seed so that it's always completely reproducible from start to the end so once you have to choose these notebooks you just run them again and you will end up with the exact same results last question yeah. last last question hello is this is this working um and um, the, um, fantastic work on the drivers. Um, the question is not about statistics, but it's um, for countries that want to understand better their drivers of deforestation, do you see any uh, guidance forthcoming for how countries can adapt these methods to some of the nuances of um, how drivers might be um, defined or, or um, you know, be at a different scale in their country versus a global assessment? Thank you for the question. I think, yeah, this is feasible. I mean, uh, uh, currently we have uh, some uh, guidance and e-learning that have been used for the FRA 2020 remote sensing survey. Uh, there will be probably new methodology for the next uh, global remote sensing survey, but what we can do is also to find also a way to, uh, to, to provide the tools uh, to derive those estimates and to customize it uh, according to national uh, needs. Uh, and I think that's uh, 
uh, that's something that we have in mind uh, to provide the tools and the way also to customize uh, both the sampling and the questionnaire. So all these driver analysis can be done also at the, at the country level or at final level. Yeah. Okay, be before we close, maybe Aurélie, you want to like super briefly complement this one, and then I will close. Yeah, I was going to say we have a uh, global methodology. Well, global methodology, but being piloted in the Congo Basin and the six Central African countries on basically using similar methods to identify specific drivers. And we've identified nine uh, drivers that we can see in planet time series data that we can use them when we see change, we can see whether there's roads or agriculture or mining implicated. And we also look at the overlap of these drivers and combinations, similar results, 90% of uh, you know, dif disturbances are related to um, ag small scale agriculture, um, but we also pull out degradation as well. Um, and the plan is now to apply these methods here, kind of take that same approach, but apply it on a systematic grid and then get those drivers out and get more of that or similar that relative contribution of drivers. You said wait, you mean foul. Sorry, foul. Yes. Um, I just walked up here. <laughs> All right. I uh, we, we can go for a very long time on and on. Thank you very much for the interesting questions. Big round of applause for the panelists. Take a break and see you in the plenary and we can bring that discussion to the next stage. <laughs>